our lectures were devoted to chronic infectious diseases, for those of you who made Reno. I just spent the last 15 minutes talking to him outside about bioterrorism, germ warfare, and the number of infections that are just floating around out there. He told me they're doing studies on ticks and the East Coast, and uh, Borrelia, Babesia, and Ehrlichia are just the tip of the iceberg. There are probably thousands of other infections carried by just ticks alone. God knows how about black flies, mosquitoes, uh, uh, fleas, and what have you. I, I have had patients who have gotten Lyme disease from fleas infested in their apartments. In your handout, you'll find his article, Bacterial and Viral Co-Infections in a Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. Please memorize this, convert it to memory, because we're all walking around with these diseases. I'd like to introduce Dr. Garth Nicholson, please. Please all pay attention. There's a laser pointer here. I want your slides. Okay. Yes, it is. It's Lyme disease. It's named after Old Lyme, Connecticut, where the disease was first described. And I'll be talking actually a little bit about that and other diseases of the intracellular pathogens, uh, principally bacterial and viral. We're also interested in, in fungal infections. If I could have the first slide, the first thing I need to do is identify my institutions so that you can see that I, I do have a vested interest. It could, is there a way to, to turn these lights down here? I'm principally representing the Institute for Molecular Medicine, which is a nonprofit research organization uh, which is dedicated to working on chronic illnesses. And of course, chronic infections are a very important part of chronic illnesses. But we established a certified reference diagnostic laboratory, International Molecular Diagnostics, that does the molecular testing for these infections. And this is basically based on, on years of technology that we developed at the Institute for Molecular Medicine. And for example, we have some of the only uh, molecular tests for some of the biowarfare agents that were casually mentioned there. And there's a reason for that. We also have a, a, a medical practice, molecular hyperbaric medicine, which uses uh, oxygen therapy along with other types of therapy in an integrated setting. Here in California, we really cannot use things like ozone therapy, uh, which I think is probably just as effective. So we, we set up a hyperbaric uh, facility to administer oxygen, which is, I think, a good uh, adjuvant with a number of other therapies in the treatment of the types of infections that I'll be discussing. Next slide. So I'll be talking about a variety of different chronic illnesses and the role of chronic infections in these illnesses. And I guess I'm preaching to the converted here uh, because the uh, American Academy of Biological Dentistry, I think, has been at the forefront in recognizing that infections are systemic. They're not just focal. And then when oral cavity, this uh, usually, if not always, translates into a systemic infection. And so you have to consider the entire patient, uh, not just uh, the, the focal lesion. Although the focal lesion may be the most obvious source of irritant to the patient, uh, in, in general, the types of infections that we deal with are, are systemic, and they become systemic at a very, early, very early stage in the entire disease process. So simply a removal of a dead tooth or something like that is not the end of the story. It, it's probably just the beginning of a, of a long uh, treatment process to, to rid these patients of these infections. Next slide. So the types of infections that we work with uh, can be causative for a disease. Uh, they can be a cofactor in the disease. And this is principally what I'm going to talk about today because we don't find just one infection in one disease. And, and this is where we run afoul from the classical uh, infectious disease uh, specialist who likes to look at, at one infection, let's say poliovirus, and one disease, polio. And in most chronic illnesses, this is not the picture that you see. The picture you see are multiple co-infections. 
and the unusual nature of those co-infections and maybe the genetics of the individual and a number of other uh, problems that the individual might have uh, to chemical, heavy metal contamination and other things makes each patient kind of unique, but they fall into different categories, and, and those categories are often very broad. And if you look at patients that get a diagnosis for a given syndrome, for example, like chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, those patients you, you know are very heterogeneous. They have a number of different problems. And in fact, when you start looking in detail at those patients, they have all kinds of different uh, infections as well as the other problems that I mentioned. And of course, the infections can be opportunistic. Uh, patients that are severely compromised uh, let's say due to severe chemical exposure or perhaps even uh, heavy metal or radiologic exposure, they're quite susceptible to opportunistic infections. And, and now we have uh, so many of these different uh, intractable infections that are floating around out there. And Lyme disease and Borrelia uh, as a component of Lyme disease was mentioned in the previous presentation. And uh, I'm not going to talk specifically about Lyme disease or, or Borrelia, but I will tell you that wherever we find Borrelia, we find mycoplasma. In many cases, we find uh, Babesia, Ehrlichia, and other types of infections. So uh, in a given disease process that we know is related to an infection, we don't find one infection. We find multiple infections. Next slide. So the multiple infections that we look for, uh, virus, bacteria, and we've concentrated in the past in a subclass of bacteria that are uh, cell wallless, mycoplasma. And uh, all those spherichetes uh, don't fall in the cell wallless category. They, they have a rudimentary cell wall. And the commonality uh, among the, the bacteria that we study, and of course this also has to do with the viruses, is that they're intracellular. Next slide. And I think this is a, an important aspect of these infections because when they get inside the cell, they cause a number of different problems that are not associated with bacteria that do not penetrate into cells. And the example that, that I was giving outside was the fact that uh, if you have a spirochete or, or a, uh, a mycoplasma or something like this that's inside the cell, uh, they tend to utilize the metabolism of the cell. Usually these are bacteria that are more rudimentary compared to the normal bacteria that you might find living uh, exterior to tissues in the oral cavity. These are bacteria that have lost some of their genetics over their evolution, and so they're dependent upon the cell to provide them with materials. And um, one of the more common materials that they need are lipids. And so they steal lipids from the cell. And so the little arrows down here to lipid compartments uh, as well as to, to nuclear compartments. And when this happens, uh, they cause electrical disturbances in the cell. Why? Because the, the main uh, resistance to conduction of electricity in the cell are the, li the lipid membranes. This is the insulation of the cell. And in fact, the mitochondria are dependent upon that insulation to generate energy. And when you start ripping the lipids out of the mitochondria, it's just like taking the insulation off a battery. You run them down. And this is why we think that people that have these infections fall in the category of fatiguing illness. They don't have energy anymore. And, and the, one of the reasons they don't have energy is that their energy systems are being compromised. And one of the reasons they're being compromised is their lipid membranes are being compromised. And this causes the electrical changes in the cells. And some of the uh, techniques that are utilized uh, to diagnose an abnormality without knowing exactly what it's from are actually due to these electrical changes uh, in the cell, and we think caused to a large degree by lipid disturbances in the membrane. So any type of infection that can modify uh, the lipid or take the lipid, steal the lipid, remove it from its normal environment uh, can cause electrical disturbances. So viruses and bacteria can fall into those categories. Viruses don't make any of their own lipids either. And so a, a, a viral episode in a cell will require lipid. And so we'll have to get that from the host as well. Now the other property that's kind of interesting um, <clears throat> that's in common with a lot of these intracellular infections are that when they leave the cell, they often take a piece of the membrane of the cell with them. And this is very apparent with uh, cell wallless forms like mycoplasma because, again, they don't have uh, their own lipids. And when they uh, take lipids from the cell, when they actually merge with the cell membrane and are released, uh, 
It, they're almost like a primitive virus when they're released because they're released with the lipids of the membrane of the cell that they're from. The difference is that a virus, because it's so compact, will exclude everything else and only take the lipids of the cell. Whereas these forms will take some of the antigens, some of the glycoproteins, along with the lipids, and those antigens provide an ample source for an immune response. And what this does is it sets up a concomitant immune response, we feel, that the host antigens carried by these microorganisms, the Borrelia, the mycoplasmas, and other things, uh, when recognized by the immune system, can result in an autoimmune response because the, uh, the individual or the organism will respond to, uh, against the foreign antigens carried by the foreign invader and also recognize the host antigens on that foreign invader as foreign. And this will set up an immune response that will ultimately go back to the cell which harbored the infection, resulting in an immune response. And that is known as an autoimmune response, I should say. So this is one of the problems that we, we face, and that's why the people that have these chronic infections often show the characteristics of autoimmune disease. And so in, in rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis, and I'll talk about MS and, and Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, later on in my presentation, virtually all these patients have these infections. Next slide. So some of the infections that we're, uh, we'll be discussing today are mycoplasma, chlamydia. Uh, I'm not going to really mention much, much about rickettsia. Uh, Brucella, another one that we're interested in, which, which is really increasing very rapidly. Borrelia, of course, you've just heard about, is increasing uh, very rapidly in, in, in the population. Uh, Coxiella, all these by themselves can cause fatiguing illnesses, but we think that uh, they're not alone, that they're most often in the form of co-infections. And I mentioned Borrelia and mycoplasma uh, because almost all Lyme's disease patients have this combination. Uh, we're also interested in certain viruses, uh, and I'll talk primarily about uh, HHV6, human herpes virus 6 and CMV, and a little bit about an enterovirus. It's in the poliovirus family and its relationship to autoimmune disease, particularly ALS, because that's of interest. Uh, and I put in a little box down there, fungal infections. Now, fungal infections are important. I'm not going to really spend much time on them today. But again, it's part of the whole problem of the co-infections that uh, these patients uh, have. And so different patients will have different combinations, overlapping combinations of these infections. Next slide. Can I take the questions at the end? And I think it's probably easier that way. So if we look at this whole picture of chronic infections, uh, I've estimated in our own studies that more than 80% of the patients in, in these chronic disease categories have these co-infections. Uh, <coughs> And, and it may be 100%. We're just not sure. But, I, but I'm sure of those figures because we have hard data on that. And usually they fall into different categories. But the biggest category is really the, the combination of various uh, bacteria and viruses. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, mycoplasma, chlamydia. Uh, I'll mention Borrelia, but I didn't bring any data on that because I, I didn't realize how interested you were in, in Borrelia infections. And viruses, I'll, I'll talk about uh, CMV and HHV6. Next slide. And these occur in a, in a variety of different disease states uh, that account for a huge uh, number of patients, uh, not only in our country, but worldwide. For example, respiratory diseases, things like chronic asthma, uh, these types of chronic infections are extremely important uh, in chronic bronchitis and chronic asthma. Rheumatic diseases, I'll come back to that in, in just a moment, but uh, we've concentrated on rheumatoid arthritis as an important uh, uh, disease entity where you find these infections in the synovium and they set up an autoimmune attack. I'll spend most of my time on, on the fatigue syndromes, uh, like uh, fibromyalgia syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, and I'll bring in Gulf War illness because this is one way that, that we got into this uh, whole area in the first place. Next slide. Next slide. Did we? Uh, I can't control the slides here, so somebody back there is going to have to control them. Gastrointestinal uh, disorders, uh, GU disorders, these are pretty obvious. Uh, next slide. Uh, getting down to the uh, autoimmune diseases. Now I'm going to spend some time on, on MS and ALS. Uh, 
Uh, but we've also done some work on systemic lupus and, and Graves' disease as well. Graves' disease is, is a thyroiditis. It's an infection of, uh, of the thyroid, for example. And uh, we've identified some of the infections involved in that. And of course, number nine, periodontal diseases. Uh, this we consider to be very important. In fact, a, a lot of patients, uh, this may be their first encounter with an infection that ultimately becomes systemic. So I think it's very important that people that, that work in the oral cavity understand, and I think you do here, that uh, these are situations that rapidly become systemic. So it's not just a dental problem, it's a systemic problem. And that also you are at risk because you work in the oral cavity uh, from obtaining uh, some of these infections. And I'll come back to that at the end because I'm going to present a, a, an example of that. It's a family study that we did on Gulf War veterans showing the transmission of the infections that we found in Gulf War veterans to their spouses and in their children. And of course, most of these patients had dental problems, which I'll discuss briefly. And when they got to the children, and the children start, uh, were diagnosed with things like autism and attention deficit disorder, and some of the syndromes that are often associated uh, with uh, multiple uh, vaccines. Uh, cardiac diseases, we're very interested in, in diseases like endocarditis, myocarditis, and arteriosclerosis. These, of course, are, are very important in our population, important sources of morbidity and death in, in our population. And uh, within my own family, I had uh, all the older members of my family had heart infections, and we were able to identify those early on and arrest their uh, process of, of uh, degeneration and ultimately death uh, because of that. And, and I, frankly, I'm, I, I would not be surprised to, to know that uh, most uh, heart patients in this country uh, have these chronic infections that have gone undiagnosed virtually for years and won't be diagnosed by their cardiologists uh, because they're not looking for them. And it's only when the extreme signs of infection show up do they bring in an infectious disease specialist to deal with this? But otherwise, uh, they're just kind of oblivious to the problems, looking more at the function of the heart uh, uh, as a uh, mechanical <coughs> device and as an electrical device rather than a device that uh, is tied up with our immune system. It's tied up with uh, a variety of other systems in our cells. And of course, uh, immunosuppressive diseases, um, obviously uh, HIV, AIDS, and cancers, and other immunosuppressive conditions leave patients wide open for a variety of different infections. So they're, uh, I think, uh, uh, principally their morbidity is caused by these types of opportunistic infections. Next slide. That's a genetic-based disease, uh, which is an immunosuppressive disease. Uh, I'm going to talk principally about fibromyalgia syndrome and chronic fatigue syndrome. And these are two fatiguing illnesses that have overlapping signs and symptoms. And the characteristic of many of these chronic uh, illnesses is that there, there are no characteristic signs or symptoms that you can point to and say, uh, this is a disease, this is a symptom, and, and so on. And, and also, this is the treatment, because there's no standard treatment for these diseases either. But if you look at the signs and symptoms, uh, you, often there are 20 to 40 signs and symptoms associated with these two syndromes. And uh, most patients that we have dealt with, uh, actually, if they have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia syndrome, usually have a secondary do diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome and vice versa. So th that's how overlapping they are. Most patients actually have both uh, diagnoses. The difference is that if your major complaints are mus muscle pain, weakness, and tenderness, and you have all these other secondary conditions, uh, you'll probably get a diagnosis of fibromyalgia syndrome. If, on the other hand, your major complaint is chronic fatigue, joint pain, and sometimes swollen lymph nodes and other problems, you'll probably get a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. But otherwise, you can't easily distinguish between the two. And in some of our studies, we've had to throw them in together because the patients had both diagnoses. So we couldn't say that they were just a chronic fatigue syndrome patient or just a fibromyalgia syndrome patient. And of course, a lot of this depends upon their, their primary care physician or the specialist that sees them. Uh, you, you know, the, the diagnosis that they get if they see a rheumatologist might be more likely to be fibromyalgia syndrome. Uh, if, on the other hand, they see somebody else, they might get a definition of chronic fatigue syndrome. So it, it, again, it, it depends on who's looking at the problem. Next slide. 
Uh, I, I'm just going to, I mentioned that there are 20 to 40 signs and symptoms, and this is just showing that if you look at chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia syndrome, or Gulf War illness, as the darker panels show here, and you look at 120 signs and symptoms in a, in a way that we've chosen to analyze the signs and symptoms, and then put them in about 39 categories, uh, they look almost identical. So this really shows the incidence rate of a major change in these signs and symptoms after the onset of illness. So if you look, for example, up here at depression or short-term memory loss or balance or fatigue and so on, all those dark bars are the same. The only where it's different are the green bars. And the green bars are chronically ill patients where we haven't identified a chronic infection. So they do look different from everything else. So in, in every patient where we've identified a chronic infection, they look uh, remarkably similar in terms of the signs and symptoms. Next slide is just, I think, the, the next panel on that. We'll skip that one. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Next slide. Now, how do we test for these infections? And I mentioned that uh, we set up a certified reference diagnostic laboratory to do this. And we're shifting away, or we shifted away years ago, actually, from uh, relatively insensitive tests that I think the last speaker mentioned are uh, often uh, only able to detect 30 percent, for example, of Lyme disease patients and so on. These are antibody-based tests, and, and uh, those are not very sensitive. We've gone more to molecular tests, like polymerase chain reaction and, and other tests that we've developed, uh, more direct nature, for probing the genetic uh, sequences in, in a sample. Now, these also have their limitations, and usually it's the, the, the limitation is the source of material used for testing, and it's most often blood, and so it's dependent upon a, a part of the infectious process or some of the infection being released into the blood. And as you know, if it's primarily in the tissues, you're dependent upon a little bit of spillover amount that gets into the blood, and, and, and that's why uh, we think the antibody tests are so uh, erroneous. Uh, because of such small amounts of release that you really need a very sensitive type of test. So we've gone to very sensitive types of tests, like PCR, for example. Now, I put in here, besides bacteria, viruses, fungi, heavy metals, immune dysfunction, and so on, uh, obviously there are a number of different tests that can be used for these various types of abnormalities. Next slide. And, of course, all of these to various degrees are important. But let's just focus on infections. And if you look, for example, at chronic fatigue syndrome patients and fibromyalgia syndrome patients, and now we've lumped them together because all these patients had both diagnoses, and we couldn't distinguish between the, the two groups anyway. Um, about 65% uh, of these patients were positive for any mycoplasma species. And by the way, these were all intracellular infections. And uh, you can see there are multiple infections because those bars down below the various species add up to more than 65%. Uh, for example, the most common species found in North America is mycoplasma pneumoniae, followed by mycoplasma fermentans. I'll, I'll show you our, our results uh, with the, the Free University of Brussels, where we looked at European patients. You see a different picture in Europe. There, the, the, the primary infection is mycoplasma hominis, at least in the Belgian and Dutch patients that we've looked at. And I think it's also true of the German patients, but we, we haven't looked at enough German patients. Next slide. In North America, most of the uh, patients have multiple infections. Uh, so they don't just have one infection. As I mentioned, they have multiple infections. <coughs> most of them have combinations in North America of infections with mycoplasma pneumoniae and mycoplasma fermentans. But if you look down here at the bottom bars, uh, one infection, only 15% of the patients had one infection, one species. Most had uh, two, more, three, four species of infection. So obviously patients are coming in with a lot of different infections, even of a given class. So if we consider mycoplasma as a class of infections and look at different species of mycoplasma, uh, it's not unusual for us to see a patient that comes in with three or four different species of mycoplasma. U usually that's a pretty sick patient, too. Next slide. Do you separate that from a, a traditional bacterial infection, mycoplasma as a separate Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's compare the European and North American. It should be North American because we have a few Canadians thrown in there. So I, I, when I made the slide up, I forgot about that. And then somebody, one of my Canadian colleagues, uh, informed me that, uh, you know, there are a few Canadians in your group, too. So I, I have to correct that. 53% uh, were positive in, in, in this run uh, of chronic fatigue syndrome patients. Uh, 
And as you can see, uh, the highest uh, incidence is mycoplasma pneumoniae. But in European patients, again, these are, these are mostly Belgian and Dutch patients, uh, it's mycoplasma hominis. So the European patients are different uh, from, the, from the North American patients in, in the types of species that they have, but, but virtually they, they, a very high percentage of them have these infections. Next slide. Now let's start talking and considering that, that it's not only bacterial infections, and again, I apologize for, for not bringing some more information on Lyme disease with me, but I, I really didn't know until I got here and heard the first lecture the extreme interest that this group has in Borrelia, because I, we do have some data on, on Borrelia as a co-infection. And as you can imagine, most of those patients that have mycoplasma also have Borrelia too. And that's what we've found. In fact, uh, working with the laboratory uh, on the East Coast, uh, Medical Diagnostics Laboratory, uh, the principal scientific officer is Eli Mordecai, and he and I are doing a study on this where we look not only at the patients, but we're actually looking at the ticks. And uh, these ticks are just bags of infection that we've looked at. And so uh, you can imagine where you have a, a tick that contains, um, you know, more than 10 different infectious agents, that those infectious agents are going to find their way into the patients that have been bitten by the ticks. Now, one of the viruses that we're interested in is a herpes virus. Uh, it's a chronic virus, herpes 6. Uh, it has a, a very high homology with cytomegalovirus. So this is closely related to CMV. And in fact, we, we often see a subclass of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome patients that have CMV. And there's a ra rather large subclass that, that have HHV6. Uh, some laboratories or some groups have studied this independently and separately and only studied HHV6. And they found that as high as 60% uh, of the chronic fatigue syndrome patients have HHV6. Um, that's by antibody testing, which would include both historic infections and active infections. If we look at the genetic signature in the blood of HHV6 and look only for, therefore, active infections, we find it a bit lower, usually 30 to 45 percent are positive. Uh, HHV6 has certain unusual characteristics which are listed here, and uh, these types of infections it can be cytopathic to cells, as can be the other types of infections that I've discussed, uh, such as Borrelia, Mycoplasma, Brucella, and so on. We know from uh, very straightforward in vitro studies where we can take cell cultures and add these infectious agents that eventually they will kill the cells that they infect. But it's a long, slow process that ultimately results in death. And I think it's instructive to you as people who are interested in oral surgery and dentistry that uh, this process of cell killing is a long, slow process. And so you might detect, for example, electrical changes early on before cell death actually occurs. But ultimately, if uh, those infections aren't treated and the process is, is uh, allowed to continue, that the resulting part of that process is cell death. And in the case, and I've gone through this myself, I've lost three teeth and have had part of my uh, uh, jawbone removed and a, and a bone graft. And primarily, I think, because I started working early on with Gulf War veterans before we, we knew what, the, what was really wrong with them and, and got one of these very, very bad uh, infections from the Gulf War veterans and almost killed them. Uh, it's killed a lot of Gulf War veterans, as I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Next slide. So if we, if we now look uh, at the possibility that uh, if somebody has infections, that perhaps it's a subset of these patients, in this case chronic fatigue syndrome patients, and all, that, uh, all the patients in the subset have essentially the multiple chronic infections, and none of the rest of them do. And so we asked that question. In fact, we expected to find a subset that had uh, as many infections as we could look for. And we thought that perhaps those were people that were immunosuppressed because of infections, and they just collected more and more infections with time. And that's, like, that's not what we found. So, so the result was actually opposite to, to what we hypothesized. And that's that these infections seem to be independent. So if we divided up the population of patients, and we've done this for both European and North American, this is the data for North American. It's essentially the, the same kind of data. <clears throat> but if we divide them up into mycoplasma positive and mycoplasma negative, and then look at the incidence of some of the other infections that I've talked about, 
uh, like HHV6. I haven't mentioned much about chlamydia pneumoniae, but this is another intracellular infection that's uh, very common uh, in Lyme disease, very common in, in chronic fatigue, although not as high as incidence as we find with the other infections, but nonetheless important, and any other infection. You can see that the percentages are almost exactly the same. So this indicates that they're independent variables. So we can have patients that have different patterns of infection. Now, this is where we have a big problem with the infectious disease specialists who want to look at, at one infection, one disease. This is kind of like the polio thinking syndrome, where if you have a polio virus, you're going to get polio, and that's it. Of course, that's not it, as I'll show you later on. Uh, something like uh, a member of the polio virus family could contribute to autoimmune disease, but not on its own. There seem to be other co-elements involved in that process. Next slide. So uh, co-infections are common. In fact, most people have co-infections. If I could go to the next slide. And so again, back to this model, that the co-infections, uh, and principally we're looking at the bacterial and viral co-infections are very important. And again, I, I apologize for not bringing more data on fungal co-infections, but as you can imagine, where you have uh, one type of infection, two types of infections, major class of infections, you'll have other major classes of infections as well. And so the, the fungal co-infections are very obvious, very common in these chronic illness patients, and we have to take them into account in treating the patient. Next slide. Uh, if you could go back one, I think we're getting a little fast here. Are you trying to speed up my, Chris, you're trying to speed up my presentation here? I want to use this as, a, as an example of what we found from, from the Gulf War because it's instructive because this was a group of very healthy people that were deployed uh, in the Middle East in 1991. In the case of the U.S. forces, uh, about 600,000 U.S. forces were deployed, uh, including my daughter, which is how we got involved in it. And although it was a very successful campaign at the time, they admitted only 150 U.S. killed in action. In 1994, uh, we had uh, data secretly sent us from a member of the VA Central Command showing over 7,000 had died. Now the number is up to 40,000. And you won't hear that number anywhere else because it's a classified number. Uh, one piece of information that somebody else leaked out was that Gulf War veterans are dying at 10 times the rate of their colleagues that were in the service but not deployed to the Persian Gulf. So we have a problem here. We do have uh, accessible public data showing that 150,000 uh, participants of the Gulf War have been registered by the VA or Department of Defense as having illnesses, um, in many cases undiagnosable illnesses, although they've tried to push the, the diagnosis of Gulf War veterans into the post-traumatic stress disorder the mental problems as much as possible. Uh, most of us that work with this problem have said all along that, that that's just not correct. It doesn't fit any, any of the known parameters for things like depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. It fits a more organic profile. These people have real medical problems, not just psychological problems. And that's why they're dying. They're not dying of depression. They're not dying of post-traumatic stress disorder. They're dying of, of chemical and biological exposures that they received in the Gulf. Next slide. And that's why the high death incident. So uh, it was a complicated problem in that uh, most of these veterans were exposed to chemicals in the Gulf. A few were exposed to radiologicals, principally depleted uranium. In some cases, uh, um, other contaminants uh, released from destroyed reactors, Iraqi reactors, for example. Environmental problems uh, and biological problems. And we started working with the biological problems because we found that some of these illnesses were being transferred to spouses and children. Uh, so families of Gulf War veterans were coming down with illnesses. And this has been denied. It's still being denied by the VA and Department of Defense. There was a U.S. Senate study done in 1994 or 95. Uh, and at the time, they surveyed uh, 1,200 Gulf War families. They found that 77% of the spouses and 65% of the children born after the war were starting to show the same signs and symptoms as a veteran. So obviously there's a problem that's being transmitted and you can't transmit a chemical exposure or a radiologic exposure. You, you really have to transmit a biologic exposure and that's what we were finding. Next slide. So the various subsets of, uh, of patients from the Gulf War that have a variety of different exposures that, 
lead to different problems. And the same kind of picture as I said before, we have multiple exposures and we find people with uh, the same types of infections, for example, the same class of infections that we find in chronic fatigue syndrome uh, and fibromyalgia syndrome in these Gulf War veterans. Now, some of these are due to principally chemical exposure. Others are, are due to chemical and biological and some just to, to biologic exposure. But again, it, it's these multiple uh, exposures that lead to very complex illnesses that are difficult to diagnose and treat. Next slide. <coughs> Now, again, I mentioned that, that really the only thing that's contagious is if you have uh, an infection. And we were looking for chronic infections because we, we knew the acute infections would show up very quickly and be treated very quickly. And in fact, the infectious disease specialists probably found most of those acute infections right away. The chronic infections are harder to find. Why? Because, again, these nonspecific signs and symptoms that chronic uh, infectious agents produce in patients make it very difficult to definitively diagnose that patient as a chronic infectious patient. Next slide. Now, we did a study on uh, 650 Gulf War veterans uh, published in an environmental medical journal in 1995, again, showing that there's a complete overlap in the signs and symptoms of Gulf War illness with chronic fatigue syndrome. And at the time, uh, the VA and the Department of Defense was pushing uh, the, the proposal that, well, these people had post-traumatic stress disorder. And there are some that had some undiagnosed illnesses. And they were denying benefits to uh, families uh, and veterans who didn't fit in the category of post-traumatic stress disorder. And we thought that that was incredible. Uh, at the time, our, our own daughter was going through this. And um, she was a, a decorated soldier who came back from, from the Gulf War and was a warrant officer. Well, uh, she was in the 101st Airborne Division. And if you're a warrant officer in the 100 Airborne Division, you've reached the highest pinnacle of the non-commissioned officers. So she was a, a good soldier. And they were trying to tell her that she was suffering from a mental disease. And we knew that wasn't true. And she was training to be a pilot at the time, and she couldn't make it um, because of her health uh, failing. I'm proud to say that she'll be graduating from Northwestern Medical School next year, going into neurology. So. Next slide, please. Now, when we looked at the Gulf War veterans, we found that 40% of them uh, had uh, mycoplasma. And almost all of these had one species, mycoplasma fermentans. This was an unusual species of mycoplasma um, that we think is different from the civilian forms of mycoplasma fermentans that we've looked at. And we got into one hell of a fight on this when we found some genetic alterations uh, in the particular mycoplasma that we found in the Gulf War veterans. And I caught this myself, so I know this is a very difficult disease. And some of the things that we found were genetic sequences that we pointed towards a weaponized version of mycoplasma fermentans. And boy, I tell you, this almost cost us our lives in a number of respects. They went after us economically, physically, mentally, every possible way to shut us up to prevent this information from coming out. Because what we found was we found portions of the HIV-1 genome uh, in, in this mycoplasma, uh, and principally the envelope gene. And the reason we hypothesized that was there was in the weaponization process of this microorganism, this would allow it to enter cells much more efficiently, just like HIV uses the envelope product, GP120, to enter cells. So this would make it uh, much more stealthy in an individual. But we also found, very interestingly, uh, sequences from uh, Thermidopolis. This is a bacteria that lives in the bottom of the seafloor next to volcanic vents. And there's no possible way that this bacteria from the bottom of the ocean could be mixing genetically from mycoplasma. And what was the genetic sequence that we were interested in? Well, it was a heat-resistant sequence that encoded a heat-resistant protein that made the mycoplasma more heat-resistant. And if you're going to make a bioweapon and you're going to deliver it uh, in explosive ordnance, like a Scud missile, for example, or an artillery shell or something like that, the, the way you disperse it is with a low-grade explosion. And so the microorganism has to withstand heat. So that's another way to, to allow it to withstand uh, delivery and environmental changes. We also found some other uh, changes in there, which I won't go into. But those are the two most obvious ones that pointed towards weaponization. <coughs> 
And again, we didn't find these other types of species that we normally find in civilians that have chronic fatigue syndrome. Next slide. Is this any relationship to incognito? Yes, this is the one that's called Mycoplasma fermentans incognita strain. And this is a substrain of Mycoplasma fermentans that has the genetic alterations in it. Now, in chronic fatigue syndrome patients, as I mentioned before, you have these multiple species of mycoplasma, at least in the North American population. And, and this just shows the combinations of, of different uh, multiple infections that you see most commonly. Uh, fermentans and pneumonia, fermentans and hominis, fermentans and genitalium. Those are the most commonly found. Next slide. You don't see that in the, in the Gulf War veterans. You only see the one species. Now, here's the other problem we got into. Of course, the military was denying absolutely at the time that any of these veterans were infected with mycoplasma. They ridiculed us. They put out news bulletins and said we were crazy. And down here at the bottom here, it shows the results uh, from the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, the U.S. Army. <clears throat> they looked at Gulf War veterans. They found zero were positive for mycoplasma. They looked at chronic fatigue syndrome. Well, if you looked at Gulf War veterans and found zero, then they had to see zero in chronic fatigue syndrome patients, which they reported. We found about 40, 45 percent were positive in Gulf War illness, about 50 to 55 percent in chronic fatigue syndrome, and about 50 percent in rheumatoid arthritis. And other laboratories came behind us and found exactly the same thing. So we weren't the only laboratory. In fact, every, I think, reputable laboratory that's looked at this, reputable meaning that they have the expertise to do this, and, and that they have the technology to do this, has found exactly what we found, not what the Army found. And in fact, the Army result is so bogus because you find mycoplasma fermentans in one or two percent of the uh, undiagnosable population, that is, people that are just walking around, whether they're carriers or whether they're pre-symptomatic, you'll find a small incidence, like you will any infection, in a normal population. And, and they claim, no, you don't find it, even in a normal population. And that's totally bogus. Next slide. So the, these tests that we do um, are mostly molecular tests where we look for the genetic signature of the microorganism. Uh, we look for tests that are highly specific. So if we look at a genetic signature and we look at a specific genetic sequence, it's very specific. The sensitivity is very high. For example, if you use things like polymerase chain reaction, uh, they're very reproducible. In fact, we've seen this not only within laboratories, but other laboratories, and all of the Army disputes this. Uh, these are very reproducible. Um, in many cases, uh, we can confirm these with other techniques, but usually the other techniques are not as sensitive. There are some problems. There are interfering agents, and there are problems with stability. For example, in our laboratory, we, we ask uh, providers, clients, to send us blood samples by overnight courier, if at all possible, because we know that these samples will degrade with time. For example, if we look at infections, uh, like Brucella, Mycoplasma, Borrelia, that are intracellular infections. Those infections are found in the, in the blood sample, in the leukocytes, in the white blood cells. And those infections will kill those white blood cells if given enough time. And once they kill the cell, the nucleases are released, and everything is chewed up, and there's nothing there in terms of genetic signature information whatsoever. And you can see this, and we've done this in our publications by doing control uh, samples where we just put them at various temperatures and incubate them for various periods of time. So we know what the stability is of, of these genetic sequences inside uh, the leukocytes uh, in a blood cell. So we know that you've got to do this very quickly. So what did we find out that the Army was doing? <coughs> well, the we, first thing we found out is they were freezing and thawing repeatedly their blood samples. And there's no better way to destroy the DNA in a sample than do that. The next thing they were doing was they were taking a blood sample and letting it sit on a bench top for a week or so before testing it. And again, there's no better way to destroy a sample than to do that. So they were purposely setting their own experiments up to fail. And that's why we had a tremendous battle with them on this issue, and still ongoing battle. Next slide. Uh, there, are a number of, there are a number of different issues, and I'll come back to that at the very end. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the origin of the bug. And the bug, essentially, that we found in, in the veterans of the Gulf War was a U.S. Army patented bug. And so there's a huge you know, problem. How do we explain that 
this is our bug begotten our veterans after they served it. We'll come back to that. And that's the principal reason why they don't want to admit it. Yes, it does. It's, uh, it's signatory to the 1972 Geneva Convention agreements on biological warfare. And does this violate that treaty? Uh, I don't know. But well, it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is very pertinent to you as health care providers because now I want to discuss the fact that these infections, if found uh, in an individual who is sick, can pass because they're airborne infections. They're also blood-borne or other fluid-borne infections, but they can be airborne infections. It can spread uh, to uh, healthcare providers, members of the families uh, of these uh, patients, and so on. And so we did a study, and this is coming out in the next, not the next, but the volume 10 of the Journal of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. The Gulf War veterans, of course, uh, had an, uh, again, a number of different exposures, but we're only really dealing with infections because they're the only things that can really be transferred to the spouses and children. Next slide. So we did a study. Uh, we took 110 Gulf War illness patients in which there was some incidence of, of illness in the family. And again, as we've always found, there's about a 40% uh, incidence of mycoplasma infection. In this, in this study, we found 42%, so just exactly what we found before. 80%, more than 80% were mycoplasma fermentans. We found a little bit of mycoplasma genitalium. That was also genetically modified, but we won't get into that. Uh, that's why that combination is so unusual compared to what we see in civilians. We looked at 149 family members. This included the 42 veterans and 57 uh, CSF symptomatic family members, and 50 of the family members were healthy. So not all the family members were sick. About half of them were sick, half of them were healthy. When we looked at the sick family members, 70% uh, of them were mycoplasma positive. Um, and the children, for example, 75% were mycoplasma positive. The children primarily had uh, diagnoses of autism or attention deficit disorder, was their, often their most common diagnosis, not chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's a little bit different in children than in other family members. And 90% of the, of the families had mycoplasma fermentans, just exactly like the veteran. Next slide. So you'd expect that if they had some average illness or if they caught from some other uh, source an infection came down with chronic fatigue syndrome, they'd look like civilians. They wouldn't look like uh, the veterans. So the chronic fatigue syndrome patients, again, about 60% of them are positive. But the Gulf War illness patients, less, about 40% are positive. But in the CSF family members, there's a very high rate of positivity, about 80%. And in the children, the same thing, very high rate. But in the healthy members of the families, again, we don't see the same thing. We don't see those infections. So the infections are linked to the illness in the family, and it's primarily one infection the same infection that we found in the Gulf War veterans. Next slide. So this just shows this. The Gulf War uh, patients, again, almost all of them uh, had mycoplasma fermentans. And remember, I put a slide up like this before, and it looked a lot different for civilians. Next slide. This is what it looks like for veterans. This is what it looks like for family members. They look exactly like the veteran. They don't look like the civilians with uh, other civilians. Next slide. And they don't have a lot of multiple infections either. And that's the paper. Next slide. It's coming out. It's on our website. You can access it. Too. So the conclusion from that was that, uh, yes, these infections were being passed to family members, passed to children. And they came down with, and I didn't show you the data on that, but it, it, it's in the paper. They came down with the, the same signs and symptoms uh, as the veteran. So what does this mean to you uh, in your practice? Well, you will see patients that have these infections. Any patient that comes in that fills out an illness survey form in your office and says that they've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia chronic fatigue syndrome, about 70% of those patients will have this type of infection and, and probably and most likely other infections as well. So that means you will see people with these infections. And of course, in the case of mycoplasma infections, these are airborne infections. So there is a possibility that you can catch these infections and your office personnel as well. So you have to be aware of that. You, you have to be aware that, that there is a possibility. In fact, one of the largest uh, groups of, of uh, clients and patients as well, patients who are also clients, 
uh, are in the healthcare profession, nurses, some, some cases, dentists, and so on, that have, that have come down with the chronic illnesses of, of unexplained nature. So it's something you have to be aware of. Okay, now let's talk about autoimmune diseases because I mentioned that these chronic infections that get inside a cell and are released from a cell that can carry some of the cell antigens have the potential of triggering an autoimmune response. And I'm going to show you some information on that. Next slide. Well, if we look at some of these, and just using the mycoplasma as an example, because again, if you looked at Borrelia, you would see the same kind of picture overlapping with mycoplasma. Um, compared to chronic fatigue syndrome, where 50 to 60 percent are positive, if you look at lupus, it's 40 percent. Uh, fibromyalgia, which is often put in the autoimmune category, is higher, 60 to 70 percent. Rheumatoid arthritis, it's about 50 percent, 45 percent. Multiple sclerosis, 50 percent. ALS, it's virtually everybody with ALS has this type of infection. Next slide. Uh, and these are just some publications uh, on this. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, next slide. I'm not going to bore you with that, but you can find these on our website. Rheumatoid arthritis patients, uh, again, about half are positive. They have multiple infections of mycoplasma with different species. They also commonly have Borrelia as well. A few of them have uh, Brucella. Uh, some of them have chlamydia and so on and so forth. And, and again, they have all these combination of infections. Next slide. So you see the same kind of picture. And as a matter of fact, the main difference may be of where the infection resides. So if it resides, uh, you, you have a major infection in the synovium, that patient will get a rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis. But if you took away that from, from the illness survey forms and looked at those patients, you'd diagnose them as chronic fatigue syndrome probably. So uh, if you look at MS patients, uh, they have a variety of different infections, mycoplasma, HHV6, chlamydia, other bacteria that we've looked at, for example. Uh, so the reason I put uh, ECHO7 enterovirus in there, I'll show you the contrast between this, which is a uh, demyelating central nervous system disease, compared to ALS, which is a, really a, a nerve uh, cytotoxic type of disease. On the I think it's on the next slide. There's a really dramatic uh, difference. We'll skip this slide and go to the next slide. Uh, skip this and go to the next slide. ALS, uh, again, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. This is a, a neurodegeneration disease that is not a demyelinating disease any more than it is really a neuro uh, death, a nerve death disease. So the, the motor neurons of the central nervous system die. And we think the reason they die is that they principally have two of these infections, mycoplasma and Echo7 enterovirus, many of these also have Borrelia too. So it, we know that that's thrown in there, it's just not shown in this slide. But those two infections are found in virtually every patient, probably every patient, because these were done primarily on, on blood samples or cerebral spinal fluid samples. Now the Echo7 enterovirus is in the poliovirus family, and somebody asked me before uh, my presentation, I, don't, I think it was Chris, uh, about polio, poliovirus and ALS. And well, it's not exactly poliovirus, but it's in that family. And, and what we and other people in Europe have found that it's, it's really a principally a, an ECHO7 virus, which is related to poliovirus. And you find it in virtually every, every patient. So it may be this unusual combination. And this would explain why the incidence rate of ALS, which is this rare uh, genetic disease, and it should be rare and not increasing in incidence, it's skyrocketing in incidence. And you can't explain that on, on simply uh, a genetic mechanism alone. There has to be something else involved in, in ALS. Next slide. So you have ECHO7 virus, the route of introduction, could it be uh, vaccines or the We don't know, but certainly it could be vaccines. Now, when you get this information, I'm going to talk a little bit more about therapy at the end of my talk. But in the case of ALS, this gave us a unique opportunity to uh, design a clinical trial to treat both of these infections and some of the other problems with ALS. And we, uh, which is our sister institution in Huntington Beach. Uh, and this is what we did. We treated those patients with the viral infections with the semi-benzylated ascorbic acid. And the reason we did that is that this is a very broad spectrum antiviral. We wanted to make sure if there were any other viruses that this would hit them as well. We treated the bacterial infections with IV ciprofloxacin, although we now 
feel that that was probably not the best choice. It was just our initial choice. If the patients had heavy metals, uh, we tried to detoxify them with DMSA, again, because we think that, that this might be part of the problem uh, with ALS, is if they have heavy metal contamination, this could affect their immune system, this could affect a number of different properties that, that, that uh, again, will have an impact uh, on their disease. We tried to correct their immune dysfunction with the transfer factor and glyconutrients, like whey protein and, and others. And finally, kind of unique, uh, we used uh, certain types of uh, growth factors that we gave these patients. Essentially, they were given neurotrophins 2, 3, and 4. And the reason we chose these neurotrophins, which are in the nerve growth factor family, was to, to try and, and stimulate uh, regeneration. It's not that we felt that we could do this, but at least we felt that we might be able to alleviate some of the cell death by using these factors. And we have no way of knowing whether that worked or not. But the results of, the, of this brief uh, trial, it's a pilot trial, open label, very primitive. But we found a 20 to 40 percent increase uh, in muscle strength. That was objective measurements done independently by a neurologist with coded, essentially, patients that we, we, we had that, we, that the neurologist did not know were under therapy. So we felt that we were pretty good. I mean, we had patients, uh, some which uh, came in, couldn't talk. Uh, because of the swelling of one of the things that in ALS you, you lose your ability to speak. And we had uh, two patients in the small trial regain their ability to speak. We had two patients that were in wheelchairs that were able to get up and walk at the end of this, this brief treatment and so on. So we saw some pretty spectacular changes, but I think this is just a beginning. Uh, number one, we felt the therapy was only short term. Most of these, uh, or all these infections really that we deal with, are chronic, they require long-term therapy, they require multiple therapeutic approaches, and uh, that's why it was um, so attractive to your organization, because you consider all these different modalities of therapy, because believe me, you've got to use all these modalities against these chronic infections. Next slide. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Now, I've concentrated on mycoplasmas just as an example, because these infections are often misdiagnosed or, or not even looked for. And when they're found, they're inappropriately treated. And that has the, I think that statement holds for everything else that we've talked about, including Borrelia, Brucella, Chlamydia, uh, and the list goes on and on, and the herpes viruses and so on. And usually when they're found, they're not treated properly, and, and they're not considered in the context of other co-infections, which is very important because it does change the way you approach this problem. Next slide. So this just goes through our first recommendations. This is dated a little bit. In fact, I think I used the same slide a couple years ago when I came here, uh, that when we find these infections, we, our first arm is an antibiotic arm. The first therapy we suggest is antibiotic. And, and the reason for that is we want to slam them. We want to try and hit these infections hard to begin with. Uh, it's not that we use solely antibiotics. Quite the contrary, as I'll show you. This is only the beginning. We, we use everything we can against these infections. Next slide. Now, the reason you have to use long-term antibiotic therapy, we feel, is because uh, you can't just use a short-term therapy as most infectious disease physicians want to use against these because they're slow-growing, they're intracellular, and they don't have a high sensitivity to drugs in the first place. So this is why long-term therapy is required. Next slide. I want to show you an example of this. Um, this is why I'm an honorary colonel of the Special Forces. Uh, these are uh, a group of 75 U.S. Navy SEALs and U.S. Army Special Forces at Fort Bragg and Fort Campbell who came down with uh, Gulf War illness after the war. Now, this is the most elite group of, of our fighting personnel in the United States. Uh, if you're an Army, an Army Special Forces or Navy SEAL, you're, you're at, the, you're at the, the top. You're the very top of uh, standards for performance and health. And these people were quite sick. In fact, um, you don't know this, but uh, it became so bad after the Gulf War that they actually had to pull two of the SEAL team units uh, out of our rapid reaction force because of too many people were down sick. They were not capable of functioning as a fighting force. So these are some of the things that can happen. So we were working with uh, some of the uh, command and control down uh, at uh, Fort Bragg and their physicians, because they have their own physicians, agreed to, and contrary to the uh, Army Medical Corps and the, and the Navy Medical Corps, agreed to put their 
uh, members on uh, courses of doxycycline. So we use six-week cycles, and these are the recovery to full active duty, which is very rigorous if you're a Navy SEAL. Uh, and as you can see, that this took a number of, of six-week cycles, and these are, are people in top, top condition, and this is how long it took them, as many as five or six six-week cycles to fully recover and go back to full active duty. So full active duty, full physical uh, and, and therapy, I mean uh, full physical training and um, military activity was a criteria for recovery. And again, if you're a Navy SEAL or an Army Special Forces, that's a pretty rigorous criteria. So if you're back to full active duty, you're, you're carrying a very rigorous load in terms of your physical therapy. So you can see that even after six cycles, there were still about 10% of them that weren't capable of a full active load. So uh, that's why other things in addition to antibiotics are required. Next slide. So what do we uh, recommend? Well, first, um, nutritional recommendations. Uh, we did a study with the Bill Ray in Dallas, and uh, this was principally on Gulf War veterans, but we know the same thing is true with uh, fatiguing illnesses in general, is that the capacity to absorb certain vitamins and minerals seems to be reduced in these patients. It has to do with with their gut dysfunction. So obviously we have to correct their gut dysfunction. But one of the things that, that we were concentrating on were, were B-complex vitamins, which are absolutely essential in your immune system. If you're depleted in B-complex vitamins, your immune system starts to go down, starts to wane. So these patients were not absorbing uh, B vitamins well. So we switched to sublingual B-complex, and, and they got extra CE and CoQ10. Minerals like selenium, magnesium, and zinc were very important, uh, and so we increased that as well. We, those are our general recommendations. Another general recommendation is <clears throat> reduce refined sugar in the diet. I try and stay away from refined sugar, and we, all our patients, we tell them to get off sugar. It's very important why many patients, uh, that's, uh, sugar is very immunosuppressive to some patients, not all, but to some patients, myself included, and I, I can prove that from laboratory tests. So we try and increase the natural foods, uh, and, and the gut flora is very important, particularly in patients that have received antibiotics, or even some of these uh, homeopathic uh, remedies and other types of remedies uh, are very damaging to gut flora. So you have to continuously replace the gut flora. So things like lactobacillus acidophilus have to be supplemented at very high levels. And this helps control the fungal and yeast infections, but they have to sometimes be independently controlled some moderate physical activity. In the case of Gulf War veterans, the dry saunas were very important to deplete the chemicals from their system. So uh, in a study with Bill Ray, for example, it was very important to take people who, from the Gulf War who were chemically exposed and treat them with dry saunas uh, multiple times, uh, at least several times a week. And, and this had a, a very uh, interesting effect. It started to leach the chemicals out of their system at a very high rate. So the two best ways to, to uh, delete chemicals, you can delete the highly volatile chemicals by going in a hyperbaric chamber, uh, which I'll tell you in a moment we've, we've done. And the other thing is a, a lot of the chemicals which are stored uh, often in the fat because a lot of the chemicals are very hydrophobic will be slowly leached out through this sauna procedure. So we think that it's very important in general in chronic illness patients. Next slide. Immune enhancement products, well, we, we, we don't have a specific recommendation here, although I have some recommendations, but generally we feel that patients have to get some kind of immune enhancement while they're undergoing this type of therapy. Uh, so as I mentioned, this can be transfer factor, it can be glyconutrients, uh, like beta-glucans, it can be uh, mushroom extracts, whatever. Whatever works, and there's no real uh, formula that I can give for anybody because I think everyone's different. So we, we don't have a set formula for that. Um, if we're doing laboratory tests, for example, on NK function, we, we can take patients and put them on different things and see which uh, stimulates their NK cells as an example. But most patients, you won't want to do that. You'll just uh, want to try them on various things to see what works. And there's some uh, natural antimicrobial products. Some of these things were discussed this morning. I have a, a great interest in this because we want to get people off antibiotics as soon as possible and on these natural products, these natural antimicrobial products as soon as possible for obvious reasons, uh, some of which uh, depends on, on uh, 
the gut flora and gut dysfunction, but also the antibiotics themselves long term. Um, I'm not very keen on uh, I'm not very keen on the possibility of selecting out resistant to substrains of infection, for example, and other other reasons. Uh, so there are a lot of different products, and we, we really don't know for sure which ones are the best, and it may vary tremendously from patient to patient. Now, oxidative therapy is something that we're very interested in. In California, we cannot uh, use things like uh, ozone therapy just because the medical board will go after you here. But I don't really distinguish between ozone therapy, hydrogen peroxide therapy, and hyperbaric oxygen, which is what we use. I mentioned that we have a, we have a hyperbaric facility. In fact, we have some protocols for um, civilians and, and veterans that utilize uh, antibiotics and hyperbaric oxygen. And there's a, what we think is a synergistic effect of using oxygen. Now, why would oxygen have an effect? Well, most of the infections that I've discussed today are considered borderline anaerobes. Let's exclude the viruses for a moment, but just talk about the bacteria. Well, borderline anaerobes prefer low oxygen tension. And this may be one reason why these chronic illness patients, if they take real long flights, for example, in, in an aircraft uh, which is pressurized, but of course it's not pressurized to uh, what we'd see on the ground, it's pressurized to half an atmosphere. And if they're up there for many, many hours in a prolonged flight, often these patients will relapse in terms of their signs and symptoms within a few days of getting off that aircraft. And we think one of the reasons for that is the low oxygen tension actually stimulates uh, these things. And that may be one reason why they cause such havoc when they get into poor oxygenated areas. And this is where you as a dentist should be interested. Because when they get in bone, for example, synovium, areas that are poorly vascularized, this is where they love to hide. They can hide from the immune system. They can hide from high oxygen, which tends to suppress them. And therefore, uh, they find that a more fertile environment. And that's why these are so difficult in terms of infections to treat. So we think oxygen therapy is, is an important element in this whole process, no matter how it's employed. Whether it's employed as peroxide, hyperbaric oxygen, ozone, whatever. It's the oxygen. Next slide. Um, now, if there are viruses involved, then you've got to use other treatments uh, for viruses. For example, uh, this is just an example of HHV-6. Uh, where certain antivirals have been used. <clears throat> this slide is a little bit old because we don't really suggest gancyclovir anymore for HHV-6. Actually, Fanvir seems to work better for HHV-6. Uh, but there's some other uh, natural products that seem to have a, uh, an effect as well. Some of these have to do with the lipids of, of the virus, for example. Some have to do with some of the enzymes involved in the virus. And uh, although I didn't mention this, I thoroughly agree with the comments that were made before about the use of enzymes in the treatment. And I think this is more commonly seen in Europe than it is uh, here in North America. But I think more people are switching to using some of these enzyme uh, combinations uh, in the therapeutic regimen. And there may be a role for that not only in uh, attacking, let's say, the microorganism itself, but also in facilitating the penetration uh, for example, antibiotics or other natural products into the area of the infection. And I, and I wouldn't discount that as well. I think that's an important uh, point. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, what do you see in patients? Well, every patient's different. I've just shown a few examples here of a long-term antibiotic trial. And looking at the signs and symptoms, and I just put four examples here. The first example shown in pink is a, is a, a severe Herxheimer reaction. And often you see a Herxheimer reaction. Patients get worse before they get better. So the first thing you'll, patients will complain a lot when they start their therapy. If it's working, they'll be worse. Their signs and symptoms will be initially worse. And then they'll start to resolve. And they're, they're often cyclic. They go through episodes, as shown there in the pink. Uh, some, uh, as in the light blue, have an initial Herxheimer. And then there's a gradual diminishment of signs and symptoms. And in some cases, you'll see like the yellow, where there's just sort of a gradual uh, tapering off of signs and symptoms. Uh, that's not the normal thing you see. And then occasionally, you'll see something like the blue, where you don't see much of an effect at all. Those are the toughest patients. And I think those are the patients that have complex, multiple infections. And you're only hitting one type of infection with the antibiotics. And that's not good enough. Next slide. So those are the types of, of changes that you see. Now, what are we seeing in chronic fatigue syndrome? Patients uh, in a 
uh, trial up in Shasta County, for example, where we have a three-year follow-up uh, where we found, uh, again, 60% uh, of these patients had mycoplasmal infections. At the time, we were only looking at mycoplasma. Now we know that they have multiple infections. But they were put on uh, antibiotics, principally doxycycline, and 80% recovered from 50 to 100% uh, on just the antibiotics and the supplements. Well, now we have a much more complex uh, regimen that we use, but this was an earlier one. Importantly, that when people got through and with this regimen and recovered, they reverted to a mycoplasma negative phenotype, and that's very important. Uh, did we get rid of it or not, or is it still there? Now, not every patient will revert, and the patients that don't revert are usually the ones that are, are very, very tough patients to treat. Next slide. Now, the uh, VA conduct, conducted a trial based on our initial results where they took 1,600 Gulf War illness patients, and thank God the diagnostics were done not by the Army, but independently by the University of Texas at San Antonio because they found exactly what we found. Instead of 0% positive, they found 40% were positive, and exactly the same thing we found, more than 80% were mycoplasma fermentans. Uh, those patients were put into a two-armed trial, uh, doxycycline versus placebo, for 12 months. And recently, John Fessner uh, released the result, initial results of that trial, and he said it failed. And we were astounded. Why did it fail? And we started checking a little further, and somebody within the VA called me and tipped me off on that, that they actually found the first three months that there was a dramatic difference between the doxycycline arm and the placebo arm. And after three months, it completely flip-flopped and changed to no difference. But the diff you know, when they looked at, at the data from the th after three months, all of a sudden the controls were reverting to mycoplasma negative at the same rate as the treatment. And it's totally bogus. You know, they, they'd switched the results. In other words, they'd sabotage the trial. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And so was this guy who was in the VA was convinced of it, but he was afraid for his position and probably his, uh, his life, so he, he didn't want to come out publicly. But that's the length that uh, our government will go to cover up its, uh, its crimes. Next slide. And the reason principally for this is that the mycoplasma that we found is a U.S. Army patented mycoplasma. And here's the patent. Uh, it was issued September 7, 1993, but it was first filed, the, actually the predecessor was filed. Uh, and then a, a continuation in part was abandoned, uh, which was filed June 18, 1986, before the Gulf War. So the patent was actually applied for before the, before the Gulf War. And this is a patent that relates uh, pathogenic mycoplasma, which is mycoplasma fermentans, to a variety of different chronic illnesses and chronic deficiency, immune deficiency syndrome. Now, uh, at the same time this patent was being issued, the Under Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs was lying to Congress saying that the, the mycoplasma infections that we found weren't even pathogenic. He said, first, the Army couldn't find them, and next, th these aren't even pathogenic. They're found in the same incidence as normal healthy people that they are in, in Gulf War veterans or people with any kinds of disease. Uh, and at the same time he was lying to Congress on that, uh, the uniform uh, services University of the Health Sciences. This is a uh, uh, medical school for military physicians. It's based a, at Bethesda Naval Hospital in Washington, D.C., or in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, we have the workbook uh, from the course. Uh, commander Eileen Marty, uh, a naval commander and physician, was teaching the students at the same time that these were very dangerous infections, that they've killed service members, and they've and at the same time, uh, the Army was actually publishing papers in the pathology literature uh, where they were showing that uh, these infections can lead to death. And uh, there's, there were several publications in the pathology literature. So there's a complete political problem uh, with acknowledgment of this type of infection in, in Gulf War illness. And then because of that, I think there's a political problem to continue that cover up with acknowledging these types of infections in patients with chronic fatiguing illnesses. And I think coupled with the Lyme disease problem and so on, which is a political problem, this is, gets down to the root of the problem, the political problem, is where did these infections come from in the first place? In the case of the mycoplasma fermentans, uh, they came from a US Army pathology laboratory, according to the patent. Next slide. Next slide, please. 
So there's a real political problem in dealing with these diseases. Now, when we testified to Congress on this issue, even as early as uh, 1997, there could have been a number of different sources uh, for these. We knew, by the way, the Iraqis had these same agents. Uh, in the case of mycoplasma fermentans, we knew that they had two laboratories, one in Baghdad and, and one in Basra, where they had 100 scientists and technicians working on weaponized mycoplasma. And, that, and again, that was just one laboratory. They had all kinds of other laboratories working on other agents as well. And again, the, 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 the nature of the political problem in this is that uh, in the intelligence people that we work with trace back where they got that mycoplasma. And it turns out they got that mycoplasma uh, from Hebrew Hadassah University in Jerusalem. So here are arch enemies, scientists who should be arch enemies are, in this case, selling for personal profit um, weapons to a, a foreign country, Iraq. And of course, we sold the Iraqis uh, anthrax, uh, Yersinia pestis, which causes plague, brucella, uh, and a number of other agents uh, during the late 80s when, when we were the nominal allies of Iraq during the Iraq-Iran War. So a lot of countries were involved in selling uh, these very dangerous pathogens to very unstable countries. Uh, one not very well-known fact was uh, the 50 Italian-made biological weapon sprayers in Kuwait and southern Iraq. We know this very well because we've taken care of the Marines that had to go through these areas where they laid out biological minefields. Now to take you back to Post-1991, of course, it was denied that biologic weapons were released during the, the war, during the Gulf War. But of course, that's kind of a hollow comment because we had no biologic weapons detection systems that were deployed. So it was very easy to say we, we couldn't detect anything, therefore there was nothing there because they never tried to detect anything. But we've uh, actually taken care of people that have gone through these areas and had severe illness because they went through these areas uh, for example, marine recon units that, that went into these areas, that had to recon these areas, and came back very sick. Also, we know that a third of the uh, CBW, which are chemical biological <coughs> warheads, that mounted on Scud B or SS-1 Iraqi missiles that were fired on Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and I know this very well because the marine colonel that we took care of and his entire family uh, provided me with this information and an actual map where, where these hit. And it turns out a third of the scuds were not high explosive. They were these airburst models that uh, explode uh, about 1,000 feet to 1,500 feet in the air and they're dispersing warhead. They disperse the contents laterally. And those warheads contain uh, a compound called Prussian blue and they were mixtures of chemical and biological agents. In a typical Soviet warfare where you mix chemical and biologic agents together and use them in a cocktail. It's typical Soviet war doctrine. And the Iraqis were operating under Soviet war doctrine, so that would have been uh, you know, very normal for them to do it this way. So they knew that they were using chemical and biological weapons uh, in that war, and yet they still denied that, that they were there. And they denied the casualties were real after the war. And so we were helping to take care of some of these people who supposedly weren't sick. The biggest problem really was in, the, was in the vaccines, and that's where we think this uh, modified mycoplasma that we found came from, because not everyone had this modified mycoplasma that we found. Now, why would we look at the vaccines? Well, uh, probably a, a not very well-known fact is that 6% of commercial vaccines are contaminated with mycoplasma, and, and who knows what else, by the way? And why do we know that? Well, there's actually a publication in the Journal of Vaccine that documents this, where they randomly took commercial vaccines and tested them for, for mycoplasma contamination. So we know that that's real. And you might ask, well, you know, why aren't vaccines being checked for this? And I've asked people that are involved in vaccine manufacture, aren't you testing for these types of agents? And they say, oh, no, we don't want to test for those agents. If we had to test for those agents, we might have to remove 20% of our stock of vaccines. And that would really cut down our, our bottom line and, and make it uh, unprofitable for us to even sell vaccines. And I thought, well, if you have an idea that as much as 20% of your vaccines might be contaminated, what the hell are you selling those for in the first place? So this is, again, the political problem that we face in dealing with some of these issues. So consequently, there's extreme pressure to not acknowledge that these things are even pathogenic, that even cause illness. Because if we do, 
this would cut into huge profits in major pharmaceutical companies. So some of our biggest critics have been the major pharmaceutical companies that are also selling vaccines, massive amounts of vaccines to government and so on. So again, the political problem. Next slide. Yeah, we can talk about that. And will it survive? Well, in the case of the uh, anthrax vaccine, yes, because it's a cold-stored, filtered vaccine. And of course, you can't filter out a cell wallless bacteria. It'll, if you put in a normal filter that will trap bacteria with a cell wall, of course, the cell wall is bacteria will zip right through that filter. They don't have a rigid cell wall to block them. Uh, they'll just go right through. And, and so that's not a way that you sterilize vaccines if you think there might be a problem with mycoplasma. And that's the uh, DOD vaccines that were used, and principally the anthrax vaccine. And what's the uh, evidence that the vaccines might be the source of illness for many of the soldiers? Well, for one thing, non-deployed uh, personnel came down with Gulf War illness who received the vaccines. So I don't know a better example than that. And of course, that's being denied. Adverse reactions, there are very high rates of adverse reactions in the anthrax vaccine program. In fact, as many as 50% of the, the recipients of, of these vaccines have reported adverse reactions. Well, why does anybody know about this? Well, uh, the way the military set this up, unless you're hospitalized within 48 hours, it's, you, it's a non-reaction. Well, most of these people, the adverse reactions occur after 48 hours, so you've, you've excluded them from the entire surveillance process. Also, the surveillance process is dependent upon the VIRS, which is a passive surveillance process that's dependent upon the physicians actually reporting these as adverse uh, reactions rather than doing active follow-up and, and, and active surveillance and, and following uh, each of the participants to see if they had any problem. And the way the military again set it up is they weren't accepting uh, many of these uh, uh, reports of adverse reactions as well. So the whole thing was totally bogus the way it was set up. Vaccine failures. Four out of five of the vaccine lots from the anthrax vaccine failed FDA testing uh, because of potency and contamination problems. And they were actually taking vaccines that had been stored for 10 years. And without retesting them, they were redating those vaccines. Completely illegal. You're, you know, this completely is against FDA regulations. But of course, this vaccine, in contrary to what the military and you've all heard in the press, is not an FDA-approved vaccine. It was approved in 1970 by a division of NIH called the Division of Biologics. It was never approved by the FDA. And furthermore, the vaccine that was approved is not the vaccine that they're using. So by law, the FDA has to go back and recertify that vaccine, which was never done. So uh, there are a whole slew of different reasons, and we've written articles uh, on this. For example, there's one in and the Medical Sentinel that we wrote a year or so ago, Merrill Nass, and we've got one coming out uh, uh, in the AAEM journal uh, on this because it's even worse than I'm mentioning. Bacterial contamination, I mentioned 6% are contaminated with mycoplasma and, and who knows what else. And <clears throat> we've asked to screen these and the CDC supposedly screened these recently and said that, well, there, there is no evidence, for example, of mycoplasma in vaccines. They looked at two or three vaccine lots from Fort Detrick, and I thought, oh, these are the people giving us the problems. You think the Fort Detrick is not going to send them sanitized vaccines? Come on. We want the vaccines that were used in areas where they had a very high rate of adverse reactions, like Dover Air Force Base, where 50% of the, of the people came down with adverse reactions, and they had two deaths after the, after the anthrax vaccine, or Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu where they came down with a very high rate of adverse reactions among healthcare workers that were given the anthrax vaccine and so on. Those are the lots that we want to test, not some sanitized lot provided by Fort Detrick. Uh, this is like having the you know, rabbits guard the lettuce patch. You've heard that story. And we don't want uh, sanitized samples. We want the real thing. Next slide. Yeah, and I'm just about done. And, okay, now how do we think people came down with these chronic illnesses in general. Well, these are complex illnesses, and they're not due to, to one cause. They're due to multiple causes. And I put a number of things in here, chemical exposures, vaccines, uh, genetic predisposition were important, and biologic exposures, obviously the exposure to bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Uh, 
Ultimately, some combination of this, uh, we feel, results in chronic illness. And, and it's probably different for different patients. And everybody's uh, unique in terms of their own constitution. So, but it's clear that just strictly chemical exposures alone can lead to conditions like uh, multiple chemical sensitivity syndrome or organophosphate-induced delayed neurotoxicity, two shown here in the box to, to, the, to the left. But uh, that's really quite different from what we're talking about. We're talking about different types of chronic illness, like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia syndrome, and so on. These are much more complex, that have much more complex etiologies and involve infections as, as well as perhaps exposures. Often there's something that kicks off uh, the infection. And if you talk to your patients, you, you may have found out that if a patient has a chronic uh, illness, that there was something that precipitated it, whether that was an acute viral episode, for example, uh, or acute chemical exposure or something that uh, more often than not there's some event that seems to kick off the whole process and then there's a very slow evolution of chronic illness it doesn't happen right away and we think the chronic infections play a role they're very slow growing they're very slowly evolving you tend to collect them with time um, we think that all that is important so the patients in the end the, the principal disease at the end b becomes really the multiple chronic viral, bacterial, and fungal infections that they harbor. That's what becomes the main problem. And of course, then there are complications to that. We talked about briefly about heavy metals, for example. We talked briefly, I think, about chemical exposures and so on. And all this complicates the picture. But I feel very strongly that it's these multiple infections that do the most harm. And if we don't deal with these, we're not going to get the patients better. And I think that was, there may be one other slide just to give people some information on where they can access all the publications that, uh, if they want to see the, the d actual data. Email. Put, put on the next slide. Uh, we've talked about this. Next slide, just to reiterate. There's the website for the Institute for Molecular Medicine. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of the publications uh, are on the website as HTML documents. You can download them. Uh, if you can't get them that way, you can write to me. My email address is on the website. Uh, we'll be glad to send you any of the documentation that you need, any information about testing, for example, molecular testing. We'll be glad to send you as well. Uh, we feel that information in this area is quite important and that uh, our strongest weapon is truth. And I think this is why... <laughs> I think we're feared so much by some of the people that want to hide the truth from people like you as to where some of these infections came from just by pretending that they don't exist and you have to deal with the problem. So you're stuck in dealing with the problem. Yes? How do you suggest that we as healthcare uh, workers protect ourselves a bit better around some of these uh, uh, victims? Of, uh, uh, well, I think your first line of protection is to maintain your immune system and to maintain good nutrition. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the papers on my website is, is actually a diet. And the first thing that we do is for any patient that has a problem, no matter what the therapy, is to get them on the correct diet because most of these patients have very bad diets that, that probably contribute to their illness or prevent them from ever recovering from their illness. So the first thing starts with diet. Second thing starts with maintenance, maintenance of your immune system, maintenance of your endocrine system, so on and so forth. Then beyond that, uh, you know, you deal with uh, potential products from patients, like blood, for example, uh, that you've got to assume are contaminated. And treat, you've got to treat it that way. Now, uh, we're, we're all aware of this now because of hepatitis and HIV and so on. So everybody tries to take those general precautions, which I think are probably all you can really do. But these are airborne infections, so they're a little bit more difficult if we talk about some of the ones that, that we deal with. Uh, like mycoplasma that are, that are more difficult to deal with than hepatitis and HIV because they have the potential, for example, when you're in somebody's mouth and you're using a drill or something like that and you're <coughs> spreading an aerosol, not only an aerosol of heavy metal, but an aerosol of these microorganisms. When you drill down into a tooth, it's got a, uh, if you're going to do a root canal, it's got a, a dead root in there with these infections. I don't see how you can prevent uh, the infection be from becoming airborne. So uh, face shield might be a good idea uh, to, to keep any of that as way as much as possible. But again, it's, it's going to be very difficult. Yes, we'll, we'll go back and then over here. Yeah. 
Yes. Well, what was in the Murr building when it was blown up? Well, the autopsy records of 10,000 Gulf War veterans were in the Murr building. They were moved there a week or two just before the building blew up. So the records were all destroyed. And of course, they didn't try and recover any documents. They buried it all. So we lost all those pathology reports from the, from the dead Gulf War veterans. But that's the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's a lot of other important evidence that was lost in the Murrah building, which makes it very suspicious of why it was blown up in the first place. So without going into that, uh, there's a, somebody in the, What? Oh, cats and dogs. Yeah, uh, I love them. And they do come down with these infections. Uh, usually, uh, they can spread them to you. I'm sure of that. Uh, we do veterinary testing, so we can test blood samples from your pets. Uh, we, we often get uh, calls about that, and we do that. Because it turns out that, that these chronically ill patients, like rheumatoid arthritis, chronic fatigue patients, there's a very high incidence of pet illness in those families, particularly if you have more than one member of the family who's sick, which suggests that something's being passed. And the pets are often sick, too. Yes, they can be diagnosed. They can be treated. It's often easier to treat them. Not that they're more compliant, but uh, <laughs> it's often easier to treat them than it is uh, the, the well, well, whatever, the humans. Yes, the person behind you there was standing up. There are two uh, prominent theory in causing and treatment of disease. Now, uh, one is uh, germ theory, of course, which you strongly believe. Uh, another one would be uh, germ don't, germs don't cause diseases. Uh, the terrain or the, uh, the disease the environment causing the infection. Now, right. This is I don't know how you can distinguish two, the I, I know, two, two sort of, in a way, like a, a strong stand. I, I, I think they're the you, same. Yeah, <laughs> I, I believe that what you what you say you're saying is that you believe there's a mixture of all the factors involved, including germ, including the environment, diet, as you mentioned. Yes, absolutely. And I, I don't think you can distinguish between the two. I don't think you can distinguish okay. between things like infection and terrain because they affect each other. So, so how can you separate yeah. them and distinguish when you go between to the them? root of the problem, the very, 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 very root, Which chicken, is? egg, sometimes even involve chicken or egg. Uh, so do you believe it would be difficult to isolate some real, real root cause of any disease? Well, I think everybody's an individual, and I think uh, probably uh, among these individual patients, uh, there may be different uh, causes and of different course. roots of their disease, of and, and some of that based upon their own uh, genetics and their own systems, and, okay. and also based upon other factors, environmental factors, as well as, as chronic infections. Now, I've only principally talked about chronic infections, but I've tried to interlace throughout my presentation the fact that that's not the only thing yeah. that's causing disease. There, there are other potential environmental problems uh, okay. that, that are involved in this. And so this is, you know, I have to, this is what I do, but I recognize that this is not okay. the whole story. That's good, thank okay. you. Okay, yes. Well, we just haven't looked. Uh, I'm very suspicious about it because it's its origin, uh, right across from Plum Island, where this organism was being worked on by researchers at the USDA in that classified facility uh, on Plum Island. So why does it show up across the bay, you know, crows fly away in old line? That's the first incidence of it showing up. It's very suspicious. But, but again, I mean, it's just suspicious. I don't have any smoking gun. You seem like a very open-minded man, which is nice to see. Uh, would you uh, be open to, say, utilizing some of the other modalities that we're familiar with, whether it's AB or ART, which is a form of kinesiology, to, in your studies, to uh, enhance your your results in terms of compatibility and what works the best or whatever? Absolutely, yeah. whatever works. I mean, <laughs> but the point is that we, we started with what we knew and progressed from there. And when we first started in this, all frankly, all we really knew uh, initially to do when we found uh, the, the evidence of these infections, which is really my expertise, how to find this kind of stuff, is you, you treat with antibiotics. And we realized, well, this isn't enough. We've got to do more than that. And then recognizing, well, look, we're, we're not recognizing the other problems that go along with uh, this, these illnesses and so on. We've got to do something about the nutrition. We have to do something about the immune system, the endocrine system so on and so forth, and that just leads you on and on and on. So absolutely, we've been through a whole evolution ourselves, so I'm not going to stop where I'm 
Okay. Well, we haven't had any from this side, so yes. Well, and the, that, that was not the way the study was designed, unfortunately, so we could, I don't think we can answer that question the way, the way it was designed. We did try and uh, get a history of the illness within those families, but practically every one of those families did not have illness before the veteran came back from the Gulf War. That's what we wanted to look for because at the time it was being denied that, number one, these veterans had any infections. In fact, still uh, Dr. Fessner in his latest congressional testimony indicates that there are fewer infections in the Gulf War veterans who were deployed than in the non-deployed, and we just find that to be fantastic, and so do the VA physicians. The infectious disease VA physicians that we work with also find that to be a fantastic statement. That's the official position. So just actually documenting that the same infection can be passed within a family, and then these families can have the same signs and symptoms, uh, you know, that's what I consider to be difficult in the face of the political uh, morass that we find ourselves in that is trying to suppress any information like this, trying to deny that these uh, people even have transmittable illnesses at all, and that uh, this can even occur or that the bug even exists. So that's the political problem that we face. So we have to do it in little, little baby steps uh, to, to prove our point uh, on this. And it's very difficult uh, when you're fighting a huge machine where they've, they've got all the, the resources, all the people, all the more or less, and, and we're just little people out here on the West Coast shouting, you know, hey, hey, this is not right. So now there are more and more people who are standing up and uh, against them on this. Uh, and some of them haven't done so publicly, but uh, privately within the intelligence community, within the armed forces, uh, within the VA, and so on. But it's been a long, slow process of winning converts. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, we've, uh, and I didn't talk at all about that. Obviously, that wasn't really a topic today. But uh, we're very interested in the role of uh, chronic infections in the progression of cancer, not so much the inception of cancer, although it may play a role in certain cancers there. You know, and it, there's some obvious cases there. But in the progression, we felt that it's very obvious across the board. We studied breast and ovarian cancer, for example, and found that the, the patients that died very quickly with ovarian and breast cancers, uh, when matched up with patients at the same stage, the same history of disease, who survived, the difference was chronic infections. That we found that the patients that died very quickly had things like mycoplasma, Borrelia, whatever. Those patients died very quickly. Patients that survived, again, stage matched, uh, didn't have those infections. So we think it's very important in cancer. And we're doing, we're just trying to start a study, actually even with the VA, uh, out here on the West Coast in prostate cancer. We think, think the same thing that's happening there, that, that the prostate cancer stage for stage that's very progressive, metastasizes very early, and is very aggressive in forming bone metastases, those are the, those are the patients that, that have prostate infections of the type that, that, that we deal with here with these other chronic patients. Okay, thank you very much. Concluding remarks. Thanks so much, God. Um, in terms of dentistry, what does it have to do with dentistry? Many of the symptoms in the jaw and facial region are these infections. You know what we consider TMD, temporal mandibular dysfunction. Very often is the symptom uh, underneath which we find uh, these infections. And so, me and a number of people here in this group believe that without addressing these infections we cannot really get rid of facial, chronic facial pain and the weird brain symptoms associated with it. Also, we know that things like mercury toxicity, electrogalvanism, cavitations are the very perpetuating factor of these infections, not the initiator, but an amplifier that dramatically amplifies these symptoms. So we have to learn to address these issues.
Also, a uh, little on the political side, the government does not only lie when the public is at stake. Um, I was going through a court trial a few years ago where one of the course participants in my, for my course testified against me. He was the only person working in the VA hospital, and everything he said was a lie. I mean, <laughs> like those of you who have taken neurotherapy workshops, there was a beginner's workshop where we worked with very small needles. He brought to the testimony in front of the jury a needle that was a foot long. It was a 14-gauge needle, and he said he did all his procedures with this needle. That's how far he went. It was a guy from the VA, obviously threatened to lose his job. But on the good side of things, I wanted to say uh, the U.S. government is not the only government that lies to their people. <coughs> and, and the reason I'm here in, the con in this country is because this is the country where we people with the courage of a guard Nicholson or Chris Husser or others, you know, have the courage to speak up. And I think that's a great place because of that. We meet again at 2 o'clock sharp.